This time on Fifth Gear, Bentley have made the world's fastest SUV. Uh, oh, you... Wow, you can have a bit of fun. But can it challenge the king of off-road luxury, the Range Rover? <laughs> OK, OK. Vicky and Johnny take them on road and off to find out. I feel that this should be down a high street somewhere, not yeah. off-roading. We take a look at a 1960s motorsport icon, the Alpine A110. Light and agile, that's what this car was all about. And find out whether Renault's modern-day version can live up to its reputation. I don't know, this car's staying on the road before you do with it. Engineer and car modder Jimmy Deville shows us how to give a legendary roadster more grip. <laughs> I'm off like a rocket. I find out that millions of drivers could be stung by costly new charges for driving into cities. If your diesel is more than four years old, you're going to be hit in the pocket. And Vicky's back in big SUVs, but this time choosing her favourite second-hand family wagon for under seven grand. If you plan to put this in a garage, measure the garage before you buy one. Welcome to Fifth Gear. Today we are pitting two top-end SUVs against each other in our 4x4 dogfight. You want SUV excess? Look no further. We have two beautiful examples. Behold, <laughs> this. It's blue. It's the Range Rover Sport SVR. Land Rover virtually invented off-roading and claim this is the world's most capable performance SUV. A 0 to 62 time of 4.5 seconds and a top speed of 176. The base model cost is just a shade under 100 grand. And it has the biggest wheels and least subtle body kit. And this is the Bentayga, Bentley's first ever car in this class. We have the ultimate W12 model, capable of getting to 62 in four seconds and going on to 187 miles an hour. So it's quicker and faster and more expensive than the SVR. Even with no extras, it costs £165,000. With both of these cars being range-topping models and both of them gunning for the same affluent markets, we thought we'd push them head-to-head -to, -head to find out which one ultimately is the most accomplished. Today we're going to test them on the track and on the road, but first, Johnny is going to see how they get on with some roughly tufty terrain. Now, you may be thinking who in their right mind is going to take such expensive hardware off-roading, but they both boast 4x4 capability, so it's our duty to test it. And anyway, if I was paying 100 grand plus, I'd want my luxury SUV to cope with anything. On the one hand, what we're doing right now feels completely fish out of water. It does with this particular car. I feel that this should be down a high street somewhere, not yeah. off-roading. But despite this, the SVR is still loaded with all of Land Rover's off-road tech. This has got seven off-road modes, actually. Seven? Yeah. You've got gravel, grass, snow. Keep your eyes on the road, please, Johnny. <laughs> Mud ruts, sand or rock crawl. These off-road modes are designed to make the Range Rover as idiot-proof as possible. So I'm going to do my best to put them to the test. Oh, my gosh. I, can't, I, I, can't I don't this. know if I should be going down there. I'm worried I'm just going to take that entire SVR body kit off the front. This is the weird thing. I mean... Oh, it's, it feels wrong. That's a leg cock. Oh, you've definitely cocked a leg there. Oh, oh, oh. I think that's cocky-leggy. <laughs> oh, cocky-leggy, <laughs> sir. But as our off-road excursion continued, our reservations faded. The more we're going along, the more I'm feeling that I'm in a hardcore Range Rover and not something that's been sort of slightly blinged up. It's not a sheep in wolf's clothing. Mountain goat? A mountain goat in wolf's clothing. <laughs> that's what it is. So, despite the sporting upgrades, the Range Rover's off-roading DNA remains strong. Can Bentley's first ever attempt at a performance SUV possibly compete with that sort of 4x4 heritage? Do you know the best part about this Bentley? <laughs> it's getting in it so you don't have to see the outside of it. <gasps> We've got it set on an off-road mode that's uh, appropriate, I think. Have we got yes, yeah. dirt and gravel? Yeah, we've got four different settings and, of course, you can up the air suspension all the way yep. to the top. Which actually gives it greater Ooh. ground clearance than the SVR. 
got to love its gaudiness. Yeah. It's not a petite little thing that's got flicks and wings. But whether you like the Bentayga's looks or you don't, its curvaceous design was certainly giving me a few worries off-road. I can't, I can't actually see at all. OK. Visibility just, it's sort of, the bodywork drops away. I'll tell you what, though, it's not bottoming out at all. The steering's considerably lighter than the SVR. Oh, is it? OK. Yeah. The throttle response is weird. It's just a little bit too sensitive and a bit too eager. On these really slow sections where I'm just trying to gently creep up it and not lose traction. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wanting to go. Oh, there's a big of a leg cop. But after 30 minutes driving through the Welsh forest, the Bentley was still going strong. I think this is a deeply impressive car, considering yeah. Bentley don't really make off-roaders. Yeah. But I still truly feel that the Range Rover has got it licked off-road. The Range Rover was making easier work of it. Round one to the Range Rover off-road. I think, by a narrow margin, yeah. Range Rover has it. Next, it's time for a fifth gear team test, where we get a quick first look and first drive of a brand new car. Today, we've invited snooker supremo and car nut Ronnie O'Sullivan and modding marvel Jimmy Deville along for the ride. Today, we tested the Alpine A110. But before looking at the new car, I reckon the best way of assessing Renault's revival of the Alpine brand was to go back to where it all began, the original A110. What do you reckon? I think that is utterly charming. Lovely, isn't it? But enough about you. <laughs> Jason arrived in an old car. It was also a very tiny, weeny car. In fact, this particular A110 is knocking on for 60 years old. 1961, this was originally launched. Light and agile, that's what this car was all about. 92 horsepower, that's all it had. I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it? This car was a successful car. You know, in its day, this thing was amazing. You know, it won the Monte Carlo Rally in 71, but importantly, won the World Rally Championships in 73. Yeah. So, successful. It's just oozing character out of every little orifice. Fantastic to see a car like that in the flesh. They say the best things come in little packages, and that's true, as long as you don't have to sit in the little package. You forget over the years just how small classic sports cars were. I now know what sardines feel like. Once jammed in, though, Vicky and Jimmy decided to go for a spin, and they weren't disappointed. This handles really well. I'm smiling. You are in a little bit of magic. This has got theatre. Yes. So there's the benchmark. Good-looking, fast, agile and charismatic. That's what the new model's got to live up to. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Oh, hello, hello. hello. And then the new one arrived. <laughs> wow, look at that. This is what Renault hope will get them a chunk of the lucrative two-seater sports car market, the new Alpine A110. At 1,103 kilograms, it's 300 kilos more than the old car. However, its mid-mounted engine delivers 252 horsepower, which means its power-to-weight ratio is double that of the classic machine. Oh, that's now, it. Right, now you've stepped it up. Oh, I like this. I think Alpine has been very clever in making the car have similar design features. It's a Joy good take on that, isn't it? It's a beautiful car to look at. You know, I'm not sure about the front end. It's just not got the same drama as the old car. It looks a bit Japanese. I mean, Toyota-y. Jimmy might have had reservations about the styling, but there was one thing we all agreed on, interior space. Try that for size. Thank you so much. At least with the modern one, you've got your legs dead straight. Mm -hmm. I think this is fantastic in here, and I really like these piano-type keys. It was comfortable, it was relatively well finished. And there's going to be another advantage of owning this car, rarity. Do you know what, I, this is the first one I've ever seen. I've never seen any on the road, so it's rare as hen's yeah. teeth, and yeah. that's a cool thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. <laughs> So far, most of us like the new car's styling and extra space, but it's on the move that it's going to be really judged. So I decided to take Ronnie for a spin to see what he thought. Oh. Well, it's the first time that Ronnie's sat with me. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not sure he prepared himself well, actually. Oh. Oh. He made some weird inner noises. Oh. <laughs> 
I think they were involuntary. Oh, yeah, she moves around a bit, which is nice. I don't know how this car's staying on the road. What are you doing with it? Really, really impressive it. Great handling, especially when Jason's driving it. Mental, look at that, look. Wow. They've designed it to have a really low centre of gravity, which then makes it handle a bit better. It was great fun to drive. The chassis was really well balanced. Do you know what? I'm impressed with the steering. It's pinpoint accurate. Good grip, good composure. Well, oh, it's nicely balanced. Made a nice noise. That's good, isn't it? That pop from the exhaust really sold it for me. So, after we'd all had a go in the new A110, it was time for the scores. Because the Alpine looks so good, drives well, great performance, nice and comfortable, I'm going to give it a 7. I'm going to give it a peachy 7. I'm going to give the Alpine A110 7 out of 10. I'm going to give the new Alpine 6 out of 10, because for me, it's a near miss. Which gives the all new Alpine A110 a team test score of 27 out of 40. After the break, Jimmy Deville shows us how to make a BMW Z3 accelerate better by reducing wheel spin. And the contest to find the best luxury SUV continues as Johnny and Vicky swap rough tracks for smooth tarmac. People will know when you are coming and when you are departing. Now it's time for all-round mechanical marvel Jimmy DeVille to share some secrets on how to upgrade your car using simple tools in the comfort of your own garage. Today, we have a cracking little sports car from BMW, the Z3. You get all the usual driving pleasures, a great chassis, rear-wheel drive, excellent build quality, plus a great price. You can now get a standard 1.9 model for about 1,500 quid and improve it for just a little bit more. Sports cars like the Z3 are notorious for wheel spin when pulling away. That's a loss of acceleration and traction, which equals performance wasted, and that's something that makes me pretty sad. It's all down to the differential, a collection of cogs that allows different amounts of power to be sent to the rear wheels. I think a little demonstration is called for. Smoke it, Paul. So, one skid mark is longer than the other. The left wheel is clearly getting more power than the right. Job's a good one, Paul. Yeah. What a look. That's because the Z3 comes with a standard diff, which automatically sends more power to the wheel that's lost grip first and is turning quickest. Maybe because of more wear on the tyre or less friction with the road surface. Anyway, that's a complete waste of performance. A limited slip diff is the solution. It prevents excessive power from being delivered to either wheel and keeps both wheels in powered rotation. Fitting a limited slip diff is going to mean traction all the way, and that's exactly why I'm going to get one fitted to this today. And bear in mind that this is a fix that can be done to any car with a standard diff. Now, I appreciate that the words limited slip differential and changing could put a bit of fear in the minds of you non-garage warriors, but it really shouldn't do, because all we're going to be simply doing is changing one component for another. Now, in the case of this, we're actually going to be using a limited slip differential from an E36 3 Series, which is a BMW from a similar era. And if everything is right, we should simply unbolt this one and bolt that one straight back on. So by now, you might be wondering why aren't all cars fitted with a limited slip diff from new? Well, cost is the main reason. In fact, this replacement diff will set you back £500, which isn't cheap. But trust me, the performance gains will be significant. Plus, your tyres will last longer as you won't be leaving loads of rubber on the road. To do this job, you're going to need a fairly standard spanner set and socket set with ratchet. Also, a pry bar, a torque socket set. Also, if you're doing it on your drive at home, you're going to need a couple of axle stands and a trolley jack. I'm going to start by disconnecting the propeller, or prop shaft, the long shaft that runs from the engine to the differential. The next job is to disconnect the two half shafts, or drive shafts. These transmit power from the diff to the wheels. To get the bolt exactly where I want them every time, it's just a little spin of the wheel. Get it where I need it. Torque socket on. 
grip the wheel to undo it. There it goes. And they come undone. On the Z3, there are six bolts each side. That's all the shafts to attach, now onto the diff itself. There's one plug on the diff, it's really important not to forget. It's actually a speed sensor, and if I was to forget to undo it when I drop the diff down, it's gonna break those wires. It's just a little squeeze and it's uh, disconnected. Just tuck it up out of the way. The diff is held in by three big bolts. Initially, these need to be loosened, but not completely removed. Now, this is a pretty serious, heavy bit of kit. I don't want to drop it on the floor, or even worse, me. So what I'm going to do is get in a transmission jack, which isn't normally used for this, but it'll cradle this perfectly. So, Paul, can you bring that in? Now, if you're doing this on your drive at home, it'd only be a couple of feet off the ground, so just make sure you're not underneath it and you'll be able to lower it down, but because this has got to come down a long way, we're going to use one of these. All right, now that it's supported, it's safe to take those three bolts out, and then Paul and I can just steady it and bring it down nice and easy. You get that one out on yep. the other side. Yeah, Gen ready? gently down, yeah. 19 bolts and one plug. Old diff off. Before I install the new diff, it needs some oil, which is much easier to do with it out on the bench. That's one limited slip diff ready to fit. <laughs> you ready, Paul? Yep. <clears throat> Got it? Yep. It's worth noting at this time that there are loads of other cars that would benefit from having a limited slip fitted, not just the Z3. Now, although fitting them on other cars will be a similar principle, actually technically how to do it will change, so it's worth doing your homework first. Keep pumping, Paul. Fitting the new diff to the car is the reverse of taking the old one out. So first, do up the three big bolts that secure the diff to the car, and then reattach the speed sensor. Then you reconnect the drive shafts, and finally the prop shaft. And that's it, job done. Paul? Dropper. Now let's see the difference this mod has made. Time to lay down fresh skid marks. This time, Paul left the workshop with a load less squealing, and that's because there's a lot less wheel spin. If we actually have a look, you can see that, yes, the right wheel did spin for a little bit further than before. But however, the left wheel spinning the same distance as the other one, but compared to the previous wheel spin, there's a lot shorter mark. And that's because Paul got traction a lot quicker because both wheels had power. One wheel wasn't spinning, he shot off like a rocket. I reckon this is a job well done. Now back to our performance SUV dogfight. We're pitting two Titans against each other to see if the new Bentley Bentayga can match the Range Rover Sport SVR. So far, we've tested rough terrain capability, a Range Rover specialism, and even though the SVR emerged on top, the Bentayga was surprisingly impressive. But now it's the open road and a chance for Bentley's luxury touring credentials to come to the fore. Will the Range Rover spec really be able to compete? The Range Rover Sport was the first car to get the SVR badge. Different headlights, different bumpers, different rear valance. It's very smart. I actually think the interior is nicer than the Bentayga in terms of modernity and sparseness. But do you really want something sparse when you're paying six-figure sums, Johnny? Personally, I want the full treatment. This Bentley SUV definitely feels luxurious, like I've walked into a top-end jeweller and I feel very cosseted and preened and fussed over. I mean, even the roof is double glazed. Attention to detail, I like. The Bentley might have the bling, but the SVR feels like a Swiss army knife of SUVs. You have to appreciate that in order to package a car like this that goes fast, can corner, can climb rocky, rutty, horrible mountains and paths, this is a huge amount of engineering. Well engineered, the SVR definitely is, but I'd like a bit of cosseting too, and my ride was about to get even better. So I'm going to have a little play with my settings. After that off-roading malarkey, I think comfort for me for now. Instantly, the suspension becomes softer and things just quieten down a bit. While Vicky was clearly chilling out in the Bentley, 
the Range Rover was now beginning to wind me up. I feel outside of my comfort zone driving this, even though I'm in comfort mode, because it's just a car which doesn't sit with my personality. It's too brash. Even with the active exhaust kind of toned down, it's still ridiculously loud. This is it with it on quiet. That's it on quiet! VBH to Johnny, how are you getting on? Crucially for me, it doesn't deliver a rewarding, exciting drive. Would you like to get out of that car and into the Bentayga? Yes, please, if that's OK. Just sitting in the Bentley seemed to calm Johnny down. Vicky, I've got a question. Apparently, the Bentayga takes 130 hours to build by the hands of 53 artisans. What is an artisan? Someone who makes pretty bread. <laughs> well, this is very attractive, robust bread. So far, I'd struggled with the concept of a performance SUV on the road, but maybe the Bentley was beginning to win me over. It's very quiet in here, 2.4 tonnes of double glazed, palatial, quite traditional surroundings, and it is a very relaxing place to be. Meanwhile, the Range Rover's more sporty character was definitely bringing out the inner hooligan in me. That noise is pretty raucous. People will know when you are coming and when you are departing. Definitely the ride is firmer in this. I feel like I'm sitting much higher than I was in the Bentayga, and it definitely feels like a Range Rover up here. The fuel economy in both of them isn't great. This is marginally better, but still low 20s MPG. Over in luxury land, I was really beginning to understand what the Bentayga was all about. There's no doubting the way in which Bentley has hidden the sheer bulk of this car on the road. The controls are light. The ride of the Bentayga I prefer to the Range Rover SVR, I think. And like Johnny had discovered, aspects of the Range Rover were now proving less appealing. I like the fact that you put your foot down in this car, it makes noise and it goes but it is big and brash and bold. And on the road, I prefer the subtlety and the really good use of power and size that the Bentley offers. So on tarmac, I'll take the Bentley. So round two goes to the Bentley. As a road car, it simply does a better job of wafting you from A to B. So now it's one all. Join us later to find out which SUV takes the overall honours as we test out each car's sportiness on the track. After the break, if the Bentley and Range Rover are a bit pricey, Vicky picks out three bargain, go anywhere, carry anything, four by fours, that can be yours for under £7,000. It has off-road capabilities that the other two can only dream about. And I reveal new proposals that could add thousands of pounds to many drivers' annual motoring costs. That's not fair. That is not fair. This is a BMW 320D. Now, it's owned by one of our fifth gear producers who works here at our offices in Birmingham. It's 10 years old, but has only done 75,000 miles. It runs perfectly and manages nearly 50 miles per gallon. In short, it's a decent, reliable, economical car with loads of life left in it. Except it might not have, thanks to the proposed creation of ultra-low emission zones in many of the UK city centres. It may surprise you to know that even cars as little as four years old may soon have to pay to drive into these protected areas, leading to many vehicles losing resale value and, in some cases, resulting in a trip to the scrap heap. Ultra-low emission zones, four words which will certainly haunt the owners of less environmentally friendly cars in the coming years. Let me explain. Air quality in major cities has been a problem for decades, and cars are a major culprit. So, starting in 1992, the European Union imposed emission regulations. Euro 1 made the fitting of catalytic converters statutory, and since then the rules have got tougher and tougher. Euro 6 is the current standard. 
To determine which cars will have to pay to drive in cities, the ultra-low emission zones will use the Euro 1 to 6 rating system. This BMW, a Euro 4 car, will definitely not get a free pass, and nor will over 13 million other cars on UK roads. And what will that charge be? A few quid per day, perhaps? Uh, no, somewhere in the region of six to 12 and a half quid per day. Think about it, that's potentially as much as £3,000 extra a year just to get into work. And it's not just cars that will be affected. Buses, lorries, vans, motorbikes, in fact, anything with wheels and a combustion engine will come under the microscope. However, some vehicles are going to be hit much harder than others. For starters, it's the old reliable diesels that the British public were all encouraged to buy not that long ago will be hit the hardest, because all burners will only be exempt if they meet Euro 6 standards. And those weren't introduced until 2015. So basically, if your diesel is more than four years old, you're going to be hit in the pocket. Petrol cars, which don't meet Euro 4 standards, which roughly means anything older than 12 years old, well, they're going to be penalised as well. And that's over four million petrol cars potentially affected. Many European cities already have emission zones. London has brought forward its plans to 2019, and other UK cities are looking to follow suit. Birmingham zones could be with us by January 2020. So how many Brummies are aware of this brave new motoring world? So if I said ultra-low emission zones, does that mean anything to you? I've never heard of things like that before. Okay. No. Next year, you might have to pay up to £12.50 per day to drive into Birmingham. Wow. What do you think to that? That's a lot. Is it the council doing anything about it? No? It's the council proposing Oh, it. really? Yeah. That's not fair. That is not fair. Not good, is it? Not good at all. Assuming these zones come into force, how much difference will it actually make to air quality? We spoke to Professor Roy Harrison from Birmingham University. So if we look at everything that pollutes the air, you know, is the motor vehicle, is the car the big driver? If we're concerned with nitrogen dioxide, which is the driver for the clean air zone, then traffic is probably 90% of the problem. And of that, diesels are by far the biggest part of that problem. So why are diesels much, much worse than petrol? Diesels create a lot of oxides of nitrogen, which create nitrogen dioxide in the air, which is a toxic pollutant. With petrol, catalytic converters take that out of the exhaust, but they can't be used on diesels. And the technologies that are used on diesels are only now being developed. So that explains why we'll be allowed to drive petrol cars that are older than diesels. But what does the government really want us to be sitting in? Most manufacturers now have hybrid cars in their showroom. This BMW 530e is typical of the type of car that will be exempt from the ultra-low emission zones. However, it costs nearly 45 grand. And here's another thing. Hybrids spend the majority of their lives running on their petrol engines because their electric-only range is so small. I mean, take this 530e, for example. It can only manage a maximum of 28 miles before the 2-litre petrol engine kicks in. I mean, is that saving the planet? Well, to find out, I spoke to Andy Eastlake from the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership. I think it's really important to say that now the cars that you buy today are an order of magnitude different in terms of their emissions from the ones you were buying even two or three years ago. One very old Euro 3 diesel is the equivalent of 20 or 30 modern vehicles. So actually, those are really getting cleaned up as we speak. You can find out if your motor will be charged by visiting the Transport for London website. You can punch in your reg and it'll tell you if it meets the standard. If it doesn't, then best get ready for a double whammy. Those daily charges and the plummeting value of your pride and joy. Earlier in the show, you'll have seen Johnny and I putting a couple of luxury sporty 4x4s through their paces to find out which is best. But you don't necessarily have to spend big bucks to own a big SUV. All of these offer seven seats, they give you a grand view and can now be yours for under £7,000. The Volvo XC90. 
the Land Rover Discovery 3 and the Audi Q7. They're all cracking motors, but they're also all diesels, so bear in mind the proposed emission zone charges Jason mentioned earlier. I'll start with something Swedish. Of the three cars here, the Volvo is the oldest. It's been around since 2002. Consequently, very early high mileage models can be had for about two and a half thousand pounds. But if you want something fresher, then seven thousand pounds will buy you a car that's about 10 years old with reasonable mileage. Over its 12-year production run, this first-generation XC90 was fitted with numerous engines. However, the 2.4 diesel was the most common and the most economical. Volvos of this era were not renowned to be particularly sporty, not least a 4x4 like this. So don't expect the drive of your life, but I could happily do many miles in this machine. Like the others, it's got permanent four-wheel drive. And what's really clever is the way this car is packaged. It is big, yes, but it feels quite narrow and it's not unwieldy in any way. Used as a five-seater, the XC90 has a huge boot, but cram in two more people and be prepared to compromise on luggage. Plus, the extra seats are quite cramped, so it becomes more of a day-trip machine. Don't forget, this is a seven-seater family car and will have been through the rigours of family life. So try and look for one that's as pristine as you can possibly find. So if you fancy an XC90 on your drive, what must you look out for? As you might expect, these cars are generally very reliable. But if there is a start-up issue in cold weather, it could mean that the injectors are on their way out and that's a £1,500 fix. And finally, you can get stung on road tax. Check the CO2 figure of the exact model that you're buying because the size of the wheels alone could push the price up from £300 to £500 a year. Bonkers. Next, the Land Rover. When the third generation Discovery broke cover in 2004, it was a world away from the previous two machines. You either loved its brutal slab-sided looks or you didn't. I did and still do. £7,000 will get you into a decent spec diesel with around 100,000 miles on the clock. And I really would recommend a diesel because this weighs two and a half tonnes and shifting that amount of weight with a petrol engine will cost money. As it is, you'll be lucky to get 30 mpg. Because this is a Land Rover, it has off-road capabilities that the other two can only dream about. Down here is a host of settings. Snow, sand, the north face of the Eiger, whatever you need, just in case you might want to go there. But of more importance are its on-road capabilities. Basically, the Disco 3 is a big square box that swallows people and luggage. If you are looking for one, go for the seven-seat option. Even though you might not want that extra pew, the seven-seaters had air suspension as standard, which is excellent. The five-seaters did not. So what can go wrong? Well, the air suspension I've just highly recommended can spring a leak. So look out for a warning light on the dash or the car sitting unevenly when it's parked. Discoveries sadly are a favourite choice of car thieves, so make sure you have a vehicle history check before you buy. And so to my final car, the Audi Q7. Your £7,000 budget will buy you an early 2007 model. And boy, oh boy, do you get a lot of car. It feels incredibly wide. Measure the garage before you buy one. In the very back, there's 775 litres of space available if you fold the third row of seats down. But if you want those seats up, then you still get a pretty useful 330 litres. So if space is your big thing, this is the one to go for. Like the XC90, the Series 1 Q7 was offered with a bewildering selection of engines over its eight-year life. However, when it was launched, the choice was a 345 BHP petrol or a 230 diesel. And no prizes for guessing which was the most popular. In fact, you might squeeze 30 mpg out of the diesel with a delicate right foot. Of the three, it is most like a saloon car to drive. It's nicely refined, it's comfortable and it's very well built. Are you now interested in a Q7? If so, here's what you need to know before shelling out. 
If you're going to buy a car the size of Texas, then expect some whopping bills. It's not unusual for a Q7 to go through a set of tyres every 6,000 miles. Servicing can be another hard hit. Handle with care, and the car's variable servicing schedule might grant you 19,000 miles before the spanner light comes on. However, aggressive driving or lots of stop-start journeys could halve this. And as with all 4x4s, there is a chance that the car will have gone off-road, so get it up onto a ramp and check for abuse. Added together, these cars, when new, would have cost more than £120,000, but now I could acquire the whole lot for £20,000. But what if I had to choose just one? Volvo. To me, the XC90's somewhat old-world charm, ruggedness and relatively compact dimensions give this car a slight 4x4 advantage. Coming up... Whoa, 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 Vicky. It's one round all in our Top of the Shop SUV challenge. Join us after the break for The Decider, a track test to see how they handle on the limit. Well, you can have a bit of fun. We're on a mission to find out whether Bentley's first ever performance 4x4 SUV, the £165,000 Bentayga, can beat an established giant of the sector, the £100,000 Range Rover Sport SVR, and give the discerning customer the best of all worlds. The Range Rover nudged it in round one, as all the brand's off-road experience came into play. But the Bentley fought back on the tarmac, leaning on all its years in the luxury sector. So that leaves one area left to test. Sportiness. This is my highlight of the dogfight, to see how they put their power down. Yeah, because this is the bit where you get to throw me around a track. Always happens after lunch. In these, which are essentially opulent drawing rooms on wheels. Although both weigh well over two tonnes, they have big power to compensate. The Range Rover has 575 horsepower and the Bentley, 606. And that's why both have 0 to 62 times that would beat a Porsche 911 Carrera. But impressive statistics are one thing. Delivering in the real world is another. You got your stopwatch ready? Oh, yeah. Here. Right, in. That's a proper old school one. Our test facility is the Landau circuit, which comprises some long flowing bends and some tight twisty sections to check if these machines possess sports car-like agility. The laps are timed from a standing start. You ready? Yeah. Got your starting position? Yeah, this is my starting position, Vicky. OK, go. Oh, it's true. That was a bit noisy, wasn't Exhaust it? Exhaust is part of the sort of dynamic mode. Do you know what's ridiculous is that noise is too loud for the speed. Way too loud. It's, it's so overt yeah. compared to any jang. Listen to it cackling <laughs> and popping. It does feel, though, that the noise should belong to, like, aeroplane or something, not a car. Well, that's one of the things about the, the SVR, is it's unashamed. SVR stands for Special Vehicle Racing and is Land Rover and Jaguar's tuning division, like AMG for Mercedes and M Sport for BMW. So it's clear this Range Rover has serious sporting intent. Though I'm not sure Vicky would agree right now. Whoa, 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 Vicky. This is a oh. big car for a small truck. Oh, there is no feedback from the front end whatsoever. I almost do not know what the front tyres are doing. It's not telling me anything. Oh. <laughs> oh. I think this is just a point and squirt, Johnny. I think <laughs> just just turn the wheel, put the throttle down, and just hang on. I think. Oh, crumbs. Understeer. There's absolute zero feedback from any from my legs, my feet, my hands. Uh, uh. Oh. What? <laughs> OK, OK. All right, well... <laughs> oh, my lordy lord. Can I say this now that I'm at your mercy? Yeah. I just have no interest in cars like this. <laughs> I just... I just cannot understand why they exist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... It's such a big slab. You ready on that stopwatch? 
I'm all right, I'm all right. The Range Rover posts the time of 58.55 seconds. Can the Bentley do any better? I want to know yep. what it feels like to go around a tight track okay. in a 2.4-tonne, 187-mile-an-hour war room. Are you ready? Yeah. Going for the grab yeah. handle straight Both away. Both of their accelerations from the off is phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's proper stuff. Oh, I'll tell you what, I've just realised I can I can adjust my headrest with these little wings. <laughs> I'm going to need the it winglets. in a minute. The Bentley has 30 extra horsepower, but weighs 130 kilograms more, so both cars have absolutely identical power-to-weight ratios. I have to say, the body roll is less in this car yeah. and from what I can tell immediately. It is loud. It's nowhere but not near as, as loud. It's, Ooh, it's not as overtly silly. This feels much more stable. The yeah. body control in this is superior. It Markedly is, so, yeah. yeah. Ooh, that's a hairpin. Oh, oh, that'll be understood. Oh, oh hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, oh you Wow, you can have a bit of fun. Oh, this has surprised me. I thought the SVR would be the me superior too. track tool. I am really shocked, actually. Yeah. That suspension setup, that electric yeah. Active anti-roll system. Well, yeah. it's 48 volts, super fast motors pumping up each side to eliminate that body roll. It's yeah. doing a fine job. Oh. I have to say, it's incredible. This is amazing. I'm yeah. really... Really it's, I mean, and I like being in here because then I don't have to look at it on the outside. <laughs> I'm actually getting more feedback as well. I mean, not a huge amount, but I, you know, the car is telling me a bit more about what's going on is underneath. It? The brakes, though, aren't quite as sharp as they are in the Range Rover, and you are really feeling that 2.4 tonne. Ton. You yeah, can't definitely. hide it. But you can hide it around the corners. Look at this. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, oh, slippery, slippery. Well, Vicky, um, so what was the time? Then? I can taste my my jagged potato and coleslaw. <laughs> I really can. The Bentayga crosses the line in 59.06 seconds. That's half a second slower than the SVR. But in these changeable conditions, it's clear there's virtually nothing to separate them. So they're very, very similar. But, but the behaviour is very different. Very different. I would buy this car because it is not ashamed of being a luxurious, expensive, outrageous SUV. Yep. And for that, I got to salute it. As for me, I wouldn't choose either. For that sort of budget, I'd buy a dedicated sports saloon and a dedicated off-roader. But I will tell you this, at his first attempt, Bentley has built something on a par with the Range Rover, a badge which pretty much created this sector. And that is remarkable, although they did need a 165 grand price tag to do so.